thank you everyone for coming uh, to our talk tonight about the art and science of mental health. Um, this evening, uh, well, I'm Nicole Buckingham Kern. I'm the gallery coordinator. So I'll be moderating this evening um, alongside Mallory Kimmel, my collections technician, once she's able to join us. So we'll go ahead and get started. What I'd like to do is I'll introduce uh, each guest panelist and um, allow them some time to go ahead and talk a little bit about themselves and their relationship to this topic. Um, if conversation starts rolling straight from that, that's great. We'll go from there. Um, if not, I have some questions to help sort of guide the conversation. Um, but also feel free that if you just feel something that you really want to speak about that jumps off of another topic that was started in the conversation, just go with it. Um, I love the different tangents we can get get on once we start rolling. So um, on that note, we're going to go ahead and start with Samantha Triunfo, um, who is the, what do we, I know you call them the Nogginators, but I feel like you're like yeah. the Pumba Nogginator yeah. um, um, <laughs> of the Empty Hourglass Project. So uh, Sammy, I'll go ahead and let you speak a little bit about that. Uh, hi, well, you all know me. Hi. Uh, <laughs> founder, Empty Hourglass Project. Um, you know, it just, it started as uh, a way to process my own grief that I was going through. Um, but mental illness is something that it's just, it's been a very familiar companion in my life. Um, and it, it was just so overwhelming at this point that it just needed a way to get out. And what turned out to be, what started as just this way to process everything I had gone through, um, you know, I just invited people in. I was like, it's going to be a small thing. It's going to be fine. It didn't turn out to be a small thing. It's much bigger than that. But um, so, yeah, it's just inviting people and everything they've gone through. And it's it's wild how far it's come. So I'm really grateful for it. So, yeah, that's that's my introduction. <laughs> so um, thank you, Sammy. And so I'm just going to sort of go across who's next on my screen. So that would be Brian Warball. Brian, can you speak a little bit about yourself? Um, hi. So my name is Brian. Um, I am a, I guess, a working artist. Um, I am a photographer and just I label myself an all around just as a creative. Um, photography is just my main um, source of um, when I'm working through this um, topic of what we're talking about with like mental health and working through the art and working through that. Um, I was actually brought in um, by Ms. Kimmel. Um, we were co-workers when we both worked at uh, Dundalk High School. We were both art teachers there. And we really got to see like how kind of like art really played a role in like kids awakening and like working through things um, throughout their own lives and just having like a space to open up. Um, so that's really what I, I'm offering at the table is kind of just like the working artist aspect and like working within it. Um, my thesis when I graduated from MICA was centered around the idea of the connection between photography and loss and grief. And the idea that photography is a way to not only just solidify somebody's presence in time and space, but also that energy and that memory that's involved as well. And how that plays into the healing process of those that are left um, when that person has passed and so on. Thank you, Brian. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, so um, our next guest is uh, Matthew Bowerman. Uh, Matthew, you want to go ahead and speak a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Matthew, and um, I am uh, also a professional actor, uh, singer, dancer, and choreographer. Um, for a large portion of my uh, life, um, uh, along the same lines, I've also been in education for 27 years, uh, having taught um, everything from theater and dance to uh, English and reading and was a special educator. Funny enough, Brian, I'm from Dundalk in Essex, and I taught at Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts down your way as well. Um, so I know those neighborhoods well um, from way back. Um, from Baltimore, now live out in another part of Maryland. Um, like I mentioned, I'm a school administrator now. I work as um, an assistant principal um, in the Montgomery County School System um, for the last nine years. I uh, did about 18 years in Baltimore County and Baltimore City. Um, 
I specialize in trauma responsive teaching and leading and my doctoral work is focused in educational leadership with a focus in trauma um, at Bowie State University where I'm currently partnering with the counseling department and the education department on the synergy between um, responsive educational work and trauma and social emotional supports. Um, and uh, I, speak, um, I speak around the country and train staff on trauma work, trauma responsive work, social emotional engagement and family and school community building. And um, I also am an author and a researcher uh, with teacher goals. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and uh, last but not least, Julia Anderson. All right, thank you. I'm very happy to be here as well. Um, I started my um, relationship with Sam. <laughs> um, I, I Well, I, I knew her from um, a uh, grief and lost support group called the Rita Project, um, where the founder, was um, had experienced the the death of her sister by suicide and um, could not find a place that she could just walk in and you know scream or you know tear up paper and express her feelings and everybody said go to therapy go to therapy well she didn't want to talk what she her her means of you know uh, her needs at that time were to kind of release and not go into that cognitive place. It was more like a bottom up um, kinesthetic sensory versus like, I don't want to make meaning. I just want to, you know, get my hands in, in some art, some um, process. So I led that group for quite a long time in the community, moving around um, from Visionary Art Museum. We were supported there on Sunday afternoons. Um, and then we moved from there to um, Load of Fun um, in Baltimore on uh, North Avenue. And these were all like very supported spaces where you could come in and make art and listen to others that had either um, lost or experienced the death of a close uh, family member or loved one, or they had attempted and survived and were trying to find meaning. Um, so that's not the typical model for a survivor suicide support group because you either have the, um, the folks that have experienced the loss and are trying to find meaning and, or the group therapy or the support groups for just, you know, NAMI or general, you know, um, mood disorders in the community. So this was um, something new that the founder, um, uh, Sharon and Kim Strauss were thought that it's really important that the, um, for the healing, for the, the persons who have attempted and survived to be in the presence of the persons who are also searching for meaning in the experience of, of death and, uh, by their loved ones. So, you know, if you can take that risk and you can, you know, enter that space, there is a lot of, um, you know, healing and support that can happen in a nonverbal way. It's, 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 you know, you're looking across the table and you're seeing somebody doing some artwork or someone is quietly having an experience that maybe doesn't have any words and you're what we call witnessing. So you're not interpreting, you're not trying to figure it out, you're just in that space. And in that space, there were a lot of people who benefited. So zooming to the present, <laughs> um, I've worked at Shepherd Pratt for 14 years. I've been a um, licensed therapist for uh, about 28 years and licensed art therapist in the state of Maryland. And um, now I am the director of the Graduate Art Therapy Program at Notre Dame of Maryland University. So um, I have, I'm right here in this break because I'm teaching this evening and um, Nicole and Sam were um, kind enough to let me kind of step in during one of my classes um, to introduce myself and be part of this, which I am grateful for. Um, 
and I'd be happy to answer questions, but I do have to get back to my students in about 10 minutes. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here, Julia. <laughs> Um, so what we can do is maybe I'll try and get, of course, I closed my email, which is where all my questions were. <laughs> so I'm trying to open those back up now. Um, so that way, maybe I can ask a few questions that um, are specific to maybe, Julia, what you would like to answer, sure. assuming... Um, I'm going to text it to you. So. Thank you, because the internet and Outlook and trying to record on Teams right now is not playing very well. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank Set. you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let me grab those real quick. And thank you all for your patience. What happens when I, you know, best laid plans. Okay. <laughs> so let's see here. Um, here we go. This is this is a good one we can start with. Um, Julia, what are some specific examples of how art has helped you or someone you know, so maybe one of your patients, cope with mental illness and grief? Well, we have a um, materials and media framework that I kind of mentioned, which is hitting like the brain in, in certain areas. Um, so if you need to, you know, move or um, if you need to scribble or, you know, in a more um, kind of, you know, kinesthetic way versus a cognitive, which is I'm thinking about this, I'm creating, you know, a collage and I'm choosing all these things. You really have to, to figure out where that person is and what they need in that moment, because sometimes the scribbling, um, tearing something apart, is really important and sometimes it's not. So one of the examples, I guess, um, I would share is um, sometimes, you know, when you have this really intense loss, you are kind of numb and or you're very defensive in your, I'm holding it, I'm holding it. Um, and then you're, you're not sure what to do. We had um, someone in our Rita Project group who had experienced a loss um, and also a, a loss of a close member of her family, but then had also, um, you know, experienced her own kind of, you know, survivor of, of her own suicide attempt. But then within um, a short period of time, a roommate from college, um, had um, died by suicide. And so all these things kind of came together and holding and holding. And, you know, she came into the group and I said, that's really a lot. You know, why don't you use some fluid media so that you can kind of release that? Well, she didn't. She took a, a felt tip red pen and dotted it, just dot, 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 dot on a white uh, five by seven card and group was over and, you know, she left and I thought, wow, you know, that still is very tight. There's a rhythm to it, but what's going to happen during this week? I always ask people if they're safe when they leave, you know, the group, but over the course of that week, she was dotting and dotting and dotting. And in that kind of process, she started tearing up and her tears hit the card and the the dots started bleeding and she was really upset that her her pattern was destroyed like the the artwork was no longer you know this very um it, you know kind of controlled pattern on the card but her tear had spread it so she brought the card in and showed us she said i i this is beautiful i like it better so if she hadn't teared and, you know, she felt, okay, now I can let it go. And then her artwork changed. And then in seeing that and in bringing it into the group, she, the rest of the group members kind of witnessed, wow, you know, I'm glad that you were able to let go. And the, the artwork that had been affected or damaged or whatever became more meaningful and more, you know, accepted. 
So I know that's a long <laughs> answer, but that's one one way that um, that I've witnessed others, uh, you know, use art to kind of move through, you know, something really intense as as grief and loss. <clears throat> So what I think I like to do is I'm going to ask that question again later after Julia um, has had to to go back to uh, teaching. I want to I want to fit in another one that I think is very much specifically focused towards you. Um, is for you how does science and art aspects of mental health intersect or coincide? Absolutely, I'm so glad you asked that because the more that we learn about the brain. Um, the more that we can, you know, learn how the arts can help to manage, you know, those those chemicals that, you know, blood or they're blocked. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot that we don't know yet, but um, I do think that making art is a safe way to either um, activate areas of the brain or, you know, kind of help to manage you know, memories um, that are stored in the brain. Um, there, There's just, you know, so much there. I always say that it would be nice if, you know, art or materials were like a prescription versus like, um, you know, medication. Because if you work in a sustained way with a certain media, you get this feedback, you know, so you're, you're in this place you you like it it's engaging you but what you're actually making in front of you kind of gives you this feedback and it reaches areas of the brain that words don't mm -hmm. um it's kind of like walking through the woods in a way you know it's like you're using your whole body and you're taking in all these senses and you are um you're feeling like parts of your brain are lit up that <laughs> don't normally um you know they're, they're you're not normally aware of those areas. So yes, I think neuroscience is wonderful. And I think that the arts are the way to, to help um, balance, heal, create understanding. So I'd like to tie that in by um, asking Matthew and Brian, like Brian is a working artist and Matthew with all of your different experiences, how do you feel that art, arts, so including movement and other items um, and science can sort of coexist or intersect um, in terms of, of mental health. Brian, please go ahead, start. You're welcome to start if you'd like. Sure. Um, so yeah, I think it, I think I can speak from more again as like the working artists where I have experienced and like how the trauma informed the practices that I was doing helped me work through some of my own grief and like understanding um, emotions and things like that. And I think that too, it came into, um, I don't know, it's, it's all comes down to like a chemistry, right? And we know chemistry is also regarding in everything, like whether it's neuroscience, whether it's the materials we use, whether it, if it's just like the like psychological chemistry of two people working together and how that energy is formed in between two people and how just um, working with people and making that mesh kind of work, um, I think is very important. And I think it's something that we overlook a lot too and how um, like we look for the physical, right? We always look for what the data says or what the testing says, but to take a step back and really understand what the psychological chemistry that's happening, what that exchange of energy does for us and kind of really giving that its place and its value is something that I think we overlook a lot. And um, I think spaces like this and creating exhibits like this lets us take a minute to really highlight it and really make people also step into that space and give them the awareness that they need to be in this space and or it, it could benefit them from being in this space and so on. I thought that was beautiful, Brian. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would, to, I think to tie to that, first of all, uh, I think that um, around the synergy between the arts and science, I think um, to Brian's point, um, 
there's an interplay that's directly connected to the human experience that that all art in its in its most thriving conditions, in my opinion, is inextricably linked to communing, to community, um, to being able to share and collaborate and create and build and spark off of other human beings, whether it be an audience watching, whether it being a group of hands all working on a mixed media sculpture, whether it be you know the photographer and the subject, um, that there's always an interplay of human exchange, energy, um, love for the work, appreci appreciation for the work, curiosity in the work. And so I think for me, the, the science piece is around the concept of homeostasis, of balance, that all things in, in nature in one form or another seek to find that in this human beings, um, like, like my colleagues all speaking here, also a trauma survivor, um, if I look to uh, various times in my story, my origins from where, where it first broke forth as a very young child and then spilled out across my life, there was always a search for balance, trying to understand balance, trying to find it, and the homeostasis or balance position of myself in the world, of myself with peers, of myself with my art, and always struggling to try to find which puzzle pieces would fit, and always realizing that the reason for me that I, I never really fit or stuck any certain place um, is because I I wasn't able to to um, it was I was just so nomadic and wasn't able to really anchor in in one place. And so I think with regards to mental health, with regards to social emotional awareness, with regards to trauma responsive practice, all those kind of areas that converge, I, I think. Um, that one of the key things, apart from knowing one's origin, identifying the work that one needs to do on themselves in terms of reflecting and improving and healing and recovery, um, that, that we're always seeking uh, balance and trying to find it um, first, hopefully within ourselves, so then we can share in, an inter, in, a, in a human interaction and in exchange with, with, with balance um, with, other, with other people, um, whether it be in order to create or whether it be in order to unpack things or to heal, um, but there's always a search, uh, or there always should be, I think, a search for that in the work. That makes a lot of sense. Um, well, I think, Sammy, do you have anything you'd like to add? <clears throat> um, I mean, as, as Matthew was speaking, just about like that, that collaboration, that community of working together with someone to share something that's so vulnerable that happened that was so tragic and vulnerable in your life. It made me think of actually the waltz room that we have, the experience that we had when shooting that. Um, Diane, the author of that story, it was really interesting how everything came together. So, you know, her story is about how her whole life she struggled with, you know, feelings and thoughts of suicide. And she felt like it was it's sort of in her destiny to die by suicide. And she attempted it one day. And uh, she drove in front of this truck and then real quick she drove back and that feeling just, it passed. Like she just didn't want to die. Um, but when we shot that story, um, she was such an integral part of getting everything together for us. Um, and she actually ended up driving the truck in the photo shoot down the driveway. Um, and it was actually on the, the house that we were shooting. It was on the other side of this road where she actually had attempted suicide. Um, so everything like came full circle for her. And she, she expressed to me how grateful she was just to have that. She said it was very cathartic just to have that outlet. And it's like this whole life is like this shadow that was kind of hanging over her. And then in this moment, it was like, oh, wow, I can like release that now. So as Matthew was, was talking about that, it just made me think of that, just that collaborative effort and, I'm not really, you know, fully knowledgeable of all the science aspects of art and mental health, but I know, I know it from living it from personal experience and just being able to see someone feel that sense of release um, and relief from um, telling their story and just this artistic outlet in a safe environment. It, um, it definitely makes an impact, it makes a difference. So, yeah. So in that sense of balance and that sort of, um, it almost seems like one, at least from what I'm hearing from everyone, is that they complement each other, the art and the science. Um, 
in effect because of trying to find that balance. Um, a lot of things in science are, if you have too much of one thing, it's bad for you, too little of another thing, also bad, right? But you hit that middle, that Goldilocks zone, you know? <laughs> Um, and then essentially the same thing in art, you know, like if you've got, if you've got too much of one thing and too little of another, wow, that image or that sculpture or that whatever is just awful. So it seems to be sort of like the human, the human nature and the way we react to our environment and our society around us is that sense of balance and, um, connection. So I think that's a really good kind of point to sort of jump off. And maybe talk a little bit more now about the art side um, in that aspect. So oh, we've got a lot of questions that could work with that one. <laughs> Nicole, uh, before you jump in, can I just add something to that sentiment that you just kind of sure, go for um, it. added? I really wanted to throw in just like a few thoughts of like something that I was hearing earlier being shared about even just like the tears crying on this kind of stipple project. Mm -hmm. Well, one, it's just like really emotionally evocative, but I also think that we all have our own pursuits, right? Whether that's art or science or, or, you know, anything, like even if it's sports and endorphins or what, what have you, but the way is, it's like, we all have our way in the world, the way that we walk, the way that our minds or our spirits are kind of guided and the ways in which we are moved by the things that we experience. And I feel like, um, in essence, it's like whatever modality is our own is our way of processing. And again, like there's no reason to necessarily like exert judgment on the line versus the dot in a sense. And, and what, what I'm trying to get at is the idea that art in the way that we've been talking about it can be a vehicle to move through it. Right. And the idea is that grief can be stagnating and can kind of usher in like suicidal ideology in the sense that there is no way out. There is no way through. And that all of these other ways of finding balance is, again, just finding this way of instead of taking like a suicidal like shortcut exit route. Right. There's always these different modalities that have supported us and recentered us into our communities and into other um, groups that can help us kind of orient through the process of grief, through the process of mourning and through establishing new connections that kind of foster whether it's new pre-existing or rekindling relationships in our lives that can kind of help ground us in the process of like progression so I just kind of wanted to throw that in, out there because that's kind of all the things I was hearing and mirroring and, and, and uh, understanding myself. Thank you. And I think those are all really good points that lead into this um, next question, which can, it's, uh, it's kind of a, let's see, um, it's kind of a, a multi-point question, but so when we're talking about issues of grief and trauma and mental illness, so how can art be used in order to promote awareness of these issues? And um, not just awareness, but um, reduction of the stigma and more understanding, like how have you found that in your own practices? Anyone can jump in with that one. <laughs> Um, sorry, I was gathering my thoughts in my head, so I stopped talking. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I mean, I think just, you know, going based off of this, you know, experience with MD Hourglass with the book and, and the exhibits and everything, um, I think, again, just being able to have that, you know, so the people who are directly involved, uh, you know, to be able to hear every person's story, um, I think the people, you know, the photographers and everyone who's been involved, like sort of being exposed, for lack of a better word, to that and understanding, like, I guess, bringing it more into their awareness, like how many people struggle with so many similar issues. Like all of our stories are different, um, but they're also the same in a lot of ways, like the way that we feel grief and the way that we process it, again, different, but also the same. Um, and I think just in the gallery, you know, 
all the students who came in and they they read all of these those strips on the tree like so many various secrets and wishes and and um tragedies that people have experienced in their lives um i think to be able to see that um because it's so easy to feel alone in in this life when especially when you're like in the thick of it like when your depression is flaring or it's just insurmountable grief it's so easy to feel like no one else has gone through this has known this level of pain um but i think to be able to see and hear from other people and and get their perspectives and what they've gone through it's sort of i guess reinforces that understanding of okay i'm i'm not alone it feels like it but there are a lot of people who've actually gone through this and as sad as it is to know that so many people relate it's it is comforting to know that someone somewhere kind of gets it um so that's my spiel <laughs> Brian? Yeah, so for for my practices, I guess, when I was really like working through like the topics that were really pertaining to the mental health and working through grief and all, um, it was really working through my thesis. And I went in and I took family photographs, and I did digital manipulations of them to kind of experience what me as a viewer and also as the owner of the photographs, and they were my family members and like, I felt like, and not all of them were family members that had passed. Some of them were still very much alive. Um, but it was the idea that it gave this, not just memory to the photograph, but an energy. And like, like the person in the photograph is imprinted on it. The person who took it is imprinted on it. That environment that it was in is imprinted on it. Those emotions are imprinted on it. Like there's so much energy and things within a photograph that can really help and access like our emotions and our inner demons and stuff and whatever it is that we're trying not to get through, right? Mm -hmm. But it also gave an awareness that like we all have photographs or the majority of people have photographs. Um, a lot of us have family albums or photographs and frames that we just have on a shelf somewhere, right? Like, and we don't give it that space and we don't give it that acknowledgement that it is just a photo and a frame, but it also has so much more to it, right? And if you just sat there and looked at it for a minute, what what do you get from it? Um, and I think also I worked into like altar building and stuff and like working with um, ideas of like um, Dia de los Muertos and how they build altars for past loved ones and how that is a very um, therapeutic thing. And that altar building, again, is not some, you know, big, scary, like witchcraft, paganism type thing. Like it's, everyone does it like so many people have altars in their own homes and don't realize it and that's where i was breaking through and i was giving examples of what altars could look like and what like you know it's not always just big elaborate flowers and photos and food and sometimes it is it's a single photo with a tea light or it's a photo and a fake flower or it could be anything right and these people were accessing their own homes and environments and realizing, oh, okay, like now I'm understanding, like this isn't just an experience this artist had and he's trying to show me. Like this is something that genuinely, if I just took a minute to just reevaluate and reorganize my area and my space, how I could enter through this way also. It's a really good, really good point, Brian. It is. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, your family does. You want to share that story as well. Did you want to lead first, Mallory? No, she wouldn't know. <laughs> um, I, we're still focusing, Nicole, yes, on, on how the arts are a vehicle for it? Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure. I, I think, um, you know, if I look at either be my own experiences or as a, as a teacher at the middle school, high school, college level, doing theater, dance, et cetera, and, and working 
with these particular students that I look back on um, who've kind of informed my own personal journey and helped me out in my own recognition of, of how much the arts uh, saved me. I mean, just flat out saved my life um, time and time again. Um, and uh, we look when we come together for ideas, for conversation around the work that we might engage in, whether it be a piece we're choreographing, whether it be a, uh, a script we're writing, uh, something we're filming, what, whatever it might be, you know, it, when we're really focusing on these particular types of things, mental health and grief, loss, healing, recovery, trauma, anything that kind of lives in those spaces of the human heart, I really always come back to something very simple, which for me informs all art, which is the story, a story, mm -hmm. that everyone has one, that that's where, to me, all, all art comes from in one form or another, an origin point. And so I really try to help, um, if I look at my younger students, to try to begin to actualize and conceptualize what it means for them to have an origin, what it looks like and where they've come from to kind of get to the point we are now in their in their work as a young artist, developing their aesthetic, understanding what's important to them, what they're unwilling to compromise, where their moral compass points, kind of all those different like little personal pieces that start to help form what really matters to them and, and gives them purpose around their, their creation and their creativity. Um, and then from there, you know, whether it be from me prompting it or that they've kind of come together uh, around an idea, um, like I looked to one particular piece, a group of 30 students and I wrote um, called Tuesdays. And we had found that across the, the course of a week, a month, years, that every student had something profound happen on a Tuesday in their life. And we took these stories and began to explore them through a variety of different media. And in, in doing that created a piece of theater around that that inextricably linked like a chain, each of these human beings across Tuesdays um, to one another. And from that place and coming together and realizing this date, this day, this idea of a day, one moment in time that affected a human being, it also affected another and another and another and all this connectivity um, kind of also acted like, um, like a bomb in, in essence to like soothe people's healing to help mitigate their loss and their grief, as well as their hope, um, and bind us in this storytelling where all of these different performers were able to like expose themselves, experience what the, whatever level of comfort they were in, the, in their place in it, um, and share pieces of the story. And, and all those little peeled off pieces of everyone's story ended up making a very synergistic kind of communal experience. And uh, we took it to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in Scotland and performed it. Um, you know, across the world, performed it here in Maryland. Um, and, you know, the kids to this day, they're all grown. They're in their mid to late 20s now, a little older than that, and talk about some of the profound effect that that still had on their life as they, you know, were coming to terms with understanding themselves and what they hadn't recovered from and what they were still, what they were struggling with and what they saw ahead in their work. And so that's kind of how we ground ourselves. And, and one way I think that um, the work, you know, from the vehicle of storytelling and, and, and origin kind of discovering first and then moving into a storytelling platform and then, you know, meeting people where they are and accessing their various um, ways to express themselves that, that really helps to create in, in that way. So something that I'm hearing, which actually is going to lead into a question I, I didn't think of when um, I was preparing some of the, the prompts, but a lot of what I'm hearing is sort of like commonality. Um, and I don't want to say mundanity because it's not, but it's sort of like the every day. So like Tuesdays, I mean, that's a day of the week, right? And it's just this, it repeats every week. You get a Tuesday every week. That's just what happens. Um and there were these instances and events that happened in these people's lives across Tuesdays. If you think about the, the photographs, uh, Brian, with the idea of everyone has an altar of some sort, whether it's a photograph or memento, or if it's elaborate or simple. Um, and then also like Sammy with the way the, the stories are going with the empty hourglass project, 
subject and, and these sort of like in the tree with all of the different, different, but similar, you know, like experiences, how there are these commonalities that tie them all together. Um, it's something that I find really interesting. So I'm trying to get to my point because I'm still processing the question that I want to ask. But um, so like, if we've got all these commonalities, right, that everyone on some level experiences, whether they're at a point in their life to where they are willing or can admit to having had these experiences or not, um, why do you feel there's so much stigma around grief and mental health? I mean, that's kind of like the, not to say it's the white elephant in the room, but um, it's a topic that a lot of people are extremely uncomfortable with, right? Um, but yet we all carry these things at some level or another. So why do you feel with having worked in these areas? Um, why do you feel there's that stigma? And what do you feel that you, with your practices, um, can do or are doing um, to lessen that stigma, to make it, I mean, it, people are always going to be uncomfortable, um, but to make it less scary, I guess, you know, to admit to these issues and, and to find healing. I, I don't know if this is right. It's, it's co coming from a purely like, well, not purely me, semi-emotional standpoint. Um, but I almost feel like, or I wonder if it's, I feel like, or I wonder if it's so terrifying because there is, it feels like you're lacking control almost. Um, and I feel like that's terrifying for humans. It's, it's terrifying to feel out of control. It's scary to be around someone who maybe is acting out of control. You know, like when people are just like with grief, you know, sometimes it's just like, when you get into hysteric sometimes, um, I think there's, there's a fear in seeing the reality of situations. Um, I think sometimes we want to take comfort in the mundane almost. I don't know if that makes sense, but everything's normal. Nothing too terrible is happening. Nothing too great. Everything's in control. Um, and I could be wrong about this. It's just my perception. Um, but I feel like for me anyway, sometimes that that's the scary part of it is letting go of that control. Um, just trying to keep everything bottled up and, and act like everything is okay. Um, as far as finding a way to get people to be more open about it, I don't know if it'll ever come to that point where everyone is a hundred percent open about it. I think it's something that we're always going to struggle with. Um, I think the best we can do is what we are doing right now is like having moments like these where we're having an open conversation about it, where people continue their, their art and they continue to put it out there. And I think the best we can do is, is not hide. Um, Cause I feel like that's, at least I know that's what I do sometimes when it gets too much, I hide um, whether figuratively or literally. <laughs> So I think just continuing to share what you feel is important, um, continue to put your story out there, to continue to support others and their stories. Um, because I think that's another thing is we might feel that it's just too much for people to be able to comprehend or to handle. And, and we don't want to push away people because we need people. We need that connection to feel grounded sometimes because it's scary when you get locked inside your head um so i mean that's my perception of it i don't know if it'll ever come to a, a situation where everyone is 100 percent open about it but i think the more that we continue to talk about it and just share our stories share our art um continue promoting mental wellness and letting it be known that it's it's normal it's terrifying but it's normal um, hopefully that'll help people to open up more, break that stigma down some. So. I think, I think that's, and I think that's exactly what you're doing with empty hourglass. 
I do. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I really do. Okay. And I think where I kind of went with like with my own practices again and just kind of focusing on what like really making me think about like, you know, what was the cause for me? Like what made me sit down and be like, you know what? No, I'm I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna experience this and I'm gonna also like put it on for my thesis show. Like I'm gonna let my professors in. I'm gonna let, you know, whoever wants to see it in and see, you know, the rawness of it. But I think it it also comes to like this idea of what I believe it's all related to time and production. Mm -hmm. We're told that we don't have enough time but you have to use the most of it and you have to produce. No matter what it is, you should produce, produce something, whether it's for the community, whether it's for you, whether if it's going to your job and making money, but like you have to be producing, right? Or you have to be productive. And when you have to sit and you have to take a moment to analyze your emotions and work through things like grief and stuff like that, one, especially like for grief and loss of a loved one, like you're sitting there telling yourself time is too short. <laughs> you you don't know how much time you have left. You don't know how much time you're willing to give. So why why can I sit here and take this moment for myself when I could be doing so much more? I could be producing work and maybe it doesn't have to be this deep meaningful work. Maybe I just need to produce to make money. Maybe I need to produce to get my name out there and then I can make the meaningful stuff or like whatever it is, right? And it's this, again, this idea that, and I feel like what we're finally breaking down is that time is a construct, right? It's it's something that was forced on us by like ancestors that they decided we're going to have a clock. We're going to have 24 hours in a day. This is what we're expected to do. This is what we're going to have done. And like it all, you know, domino effects throughout all of history. But we got to this point where now we're like, no, you know, maybe we don't need all that time for all that stuff. Maybe we do need some time to sit and process and realize what's going on and understand that like for me and working through my grief was this also a realization for and you know my own personal beliefs is that it doesn't end after passing like there is more right so that also leads to the fact that time is a construct or an illusion right like there is no time right we create it for our own purposes and I think when you stop time too, it's seen as a weakness. Or if you take time for yourself, it's seen as a weakness where you're not being productive. So how can you keep up with the rest of us? And that's and the same point that Samantha was talking about too. It's like, you don't want to reach out to people because now I'm slowing that person down. I'm slowing their productivity down. I'm taking up their time with my time. And it's like that exchange where we're told we shouldn't be doing that, right? Like that's something that society has beat into us consistently. Um, so I think now, again, like I said, like we're we're having the discussions now, like and I think the generations coming are really pushing the older generations to be like, no, we need to slow down. We need to we're not all rushing to be in our old age and retirement. Some of us are trying to live for now, you know, um, and I think having that mentality again is really where we're pushing towards and where we need to keep pushing and things like um, the empty hourglass and like exhibits like this and conversations like this are where it's taking literally that time to do it. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and there's um, something that I'd like to just say in terms of empty hourglass in relationship to that question that I was thinking about while you guys were talking. Um, just, I'm also thinking of the clocks or the, the clock mm -hmm. is really just, yeah, with the, yeah. the um, story about Sid's. The, the cute, yeah, what we yeah. call the room um so with that and and just thinking about all the things and I think something that is important and going back also to what Matthew said about the stories you know it's about stories and and um how these interrelate to each other and I I saw a play um this summer uh where there was a very wise statement in it that said all stories are witness statements I believe I don't remember quoted that exactly right but um shout out to Ann Lefter because she has an amazing mind that was a wonderful play <laughs> but the idea of like you know it, if if you're in your own space you know like you can only experience it from your perspective right and so if you're in your head and all you're witnessing is yourself you know but you put the story out there and then you realize that other people 
are experiencing and witnessing the same things, maybe from a little different perspective, right? Because everyone's truth is a little different, you know, for each each other um, in in their in their moment. Um, but I also do like the the commentary about like. I don't want to say normalizing, well, normalizing conversations about mental health. It wouldn't be like, Ooh, scary. Don't want to, you know, not going to touch the other 10 foot pole, but like having those conversations, um, and having the stories out there, like I remember reading some of the stories, um, for empty hourglass. And one of them, uh, the one called the narrator is mm-hmm. dealing with, um, the, the kaleidoscope, the, is that boy? Oh. Like, Dissociative, dissociative identity disorder and talking about how like some of the diagnosis wasn't until like after she had her child, you mm-hmm. know? And so a lot of times when you are, when you're, I don't want to say confronted with mental health issues, but when, you know, you get, I don't want to say a label because mm-hmm. human beings, we have to label everything that we do. But like when you get that label, quote unquote, and you mm-hmm. go, oh, you know, like automatically someone is almost, I don't want to say vilified, but because of the media and because yeah. Hollywood and movies and, you know, these concepts, of, well, if this person has this thing, then this is what they are, you know, and no, this is a human being. Yeah. He was just living their life, you know? And so, sorry, now I'm getting a little teary, <laughs> but it's like that idea of um, humanizing it. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And I think also, and I'm, I'm going to make this quick so Matthew can speak and Mallory. Um, I think also if you've struggled with mental illness for so long or just, you know, you've you've gone through a lot of traumatic moments that have contributed to your mental state. Um, well, I think just, you know, naturally as humans, like we need we, we seek for that identity. Like, what are we, you know, in this world was, what, what is our place? Like, just who are we? How do people see us? How do we see ourselves? And on one hand, yes, it's helpful to have a label, um, because you need that to get the treatment that you need. Um, but I feel like it's so easy to sort of fall into this. Well, I'm this illness and I'm this sickness. And it's so easy to be like, I'm my mental illness. Um, it's so easy to identify as that. And I think that's, what's terrifying is you've boiled yourself or someone else has boiled you down to just a list of symptoms at that point. And we're so much more complex. Um, and like a kaleidoscope, which is part of that story where we have so many like fractals and, and, and parts to us. We're not just like this one set of things, you know? So it's, I don't, I don't know where I was going with that. I don't know what my ending is, but <laughs> um, it was just a thought that came into my head. It's we're so much more than what we're diagnosed as. Um, so. Matthew, did you want to go ahead and. I think it's frozen. <laughs> or internet is being very laggy. Yeah. Um, Oh, nope, I think frozen. Mallory, um, while we wait to see if Yeah, I actually, yeah, I actually have, I'm not trying to like massively compete for panelist time. So <laughs> I'm like trying to mediate my, my insertions in a way, but there's, this is extremely thought provoking stuff and what kind of Matthew was saying and everybody's stuff has been really just triggering a lot of things in like, <laughs> my recent experiences. So I, I've been taking some kind of like pointed notes on things I wanted to kind of share Um, to like the point of what Brian was saying about this relationship to time and productivity and capitalism. In a lot of ways, I think about that a lot in my own artistic practice and this idea of labeling ways in which we have in a kind of capitalist individualist society brought value to ourself, right? I am my job. I am my accomplishments. I am, you know, this, that, the other, but this idea of being your job and when you don't, when you're not satisfied with your job title or I am, and you're then labeled with like a mental illness or I am you're labeled with a level of like disability in any way, shape or form, like these labels can help connect us to communities of people who have similar stories, but in other ways, it can be in a way damning us or condemning us 
to a future or a way of life that doesn't feel to in total, like in maybe alignment with our, our whole self, right? That idea of this kaleidoscopic multifaceted expression of self, this can be just saying my whole self has to be this one part, which that one part maybe also doesn't rear its head every single day. Right. So I think that that's like something I was um, thinking about. And as an educator, I like to uh, my practice focuses more on like the politics of space and how we occupy space. And again, the idea of like being alive and being worthy of being alive means we're entitled to space. We are allowed to take up space. We are deserving to own and honor the space that our bodies and our lives and our, our views and our experiences can kind of embody and envelop and take up that much space, right? To exhibit, um, to have the exhibit of empty hourglass is to also hold space to have this conversation, right? Even this digital space and even the recording is going to live on beyond the temporality of us actually discussing this, right? For other people to witness this. So I think that space is my entry point to this and thinking about how people hold space or command space. And I've had multiple projects have given students um, some which are oriented more through like a social justice lens where again, they're able to author and they often identify something where they are have some, some level of identity allegiance to. And um, recently, I think this is something I wanted to talk about, which I promise we'll come back to this idea of like the stigma around um, mental illness and um, like depression and why people are so uncomfortable. But this all was really explored through a student of mine who was going to make a zine talking about what does it mean to about like just basically unpacking like ableist rhetoric and what does, you know, having different abilities look like. And like, you know, most of the time those representations are maybe being blind, being deaf, being in a wheelchair, and maybe now we're expanding into being neurodivergent. But there's so many other things and the student really suffers from like chronic pain, which can, of course, bring on a lot of like, um, you know, like depressive episodes when you're physically unable to, and like the students like rendered um, like it's literally physically hard for them to get out of bed to even go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Right. Like and this can happen for like 72 hours or longer. It can be like these really long periods. Right. And this kind of physical neurological disorder can also lead to kind of this kind of mental, this mental state, right? So we were talking about how to make a map, like, like this idea of like being an artist and authoring our own graphic to say like, this little circle here is showing you what you think like a disability looks like, but this is the multiplicities of all these different ways that people can have a lot of different experiences that we're not talking about and like this giant kind of um, like fold out graphic. And so when we were talking about this, um, they were talking about how, and this is the part where I'm getting to stigma, which is like people will kind of like wag their finger at them and be like, Oh, like you don't have a disability. Cause like, I can't see it or Right. And this is a huge thing about mental illness is in many ways, quote unquote, it's invisible or we, quote, can't see it. Right. Or in a lot of ways, we being this kind of meta narrative of like oppressive culture. Right. Don't want to see it. And when all that's true, what I think the stigma comes from is it's and what I think is the way that I orient like my way of thinking is. The viewer only has the threshold of their experience, which goes back to the conversation of perception and perspective. If you, the viewer, have engaged in suicidal ideology, you can meet someone with suicidal Mm -hmm. ideology from a place of knowing, from a place of being empathetic. If you're being met with somebody who does not, if you're met with somebody who's afraid of death, that level of meet, that meeting is going to be, there's going to be a gap. Yeah. Right. And so I think in a lot of ways, orienting the awareness in whatever kind of space or conversation that the viewer doesn't have that experience or doesn't have that threshold and why they can't meet you where you are is also kind of part of the problem. But mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be like 
they're wrong, but it's like your threshold for pain, your threshold for grief, your threshold of having experienced trauma is not synonymous with mine. And that's okay, but we need to honor the fact that that difference is where, like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have like the end of that sentence right now, but the truth is, is like, that is in some ways being able to bring awareness to that discrepancy of experience in many ways can be part of like the turning of the key of the unlocking of the stigma, because we can bring a heightened awareness to everyone's not entering this from the same standpoint. Right. And I think that that's really a, a crucial part of the puzzle. Matthew, did you want to go ahead and hop in with that or on that? That's what I say, Mallory, that was beautiful. I, that was very uh, impactful to hear. Um, I, I would almost build a little bit on that using something else that I read of yours that you talked about. Um, a pursuit in your artwork, I believe you wrote about this um, online, and uh, a pursuit in your work to have, to kind of break away from humans and objects being expendable. Um, if I'm if I'm correct, that is your that is your language, right? That those are your words. That is yeah. me. That's me. <laughs> you know, I was I was I was doing my research, doing my homework. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, I think to your piece about, you know, we all have, you know, doors and windows that we're trying to find keys for to unlock. Um, and whether we are kind of merged together or we're standing side by side or apart, there are, you know, there are cracks in us, there are cracks between us um, <clears throat> that, you know, uh, I often say, like, you know, let light out, that let light through um, in us, in our work. But so many people, um, I think, who don't understand, and this to my point about reference in your work, um, see, uh, stigmatize and, and see um, us or our, our, our processes, our, our struggles, et cetera, as, like, expendable. Um, because it gets bound up in in buzzwords and bound up in buzz topics and and bound up in um, the over in, you know, the over diagnosing and the over medicating um, and 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 just a, a lot of dysfunction and disorder around. I think coming back to this sense of people for so long have struggled just to be present with other human beings, just to create um, and allow contact, just to allow stillness between bodies um, and, and just being present with other human beings. I mean, certainly the ages of technology, which are, are, are wonderful things for us, but also have removed us from our humanity with one another. And in doing that, um, you know, have people, um, either shot, shot, stop, um, uh, mock or stigmatize mm -hmm. um, or avoid people who, who have, you know, are experiencing these things, um, refusing to see their light, um, in many cases trying to stamp it out or snuff it out in one form or another. Um, and, and, and so I almost feel like there's a constant sense as one is trying to, as you're facing an uphill climb, as, as one is trying to, with their art, with their experience, find their voice, ground themselves, heal, recover, move forward, that there are other forces at bay trying to cap those things, trying to, um, you know, suffocate them in one form or another. Um, and so we're always almost having to justify our presence in a damaged, you know, uh, vessel in one form or another. Um, explain ourselves about why this triggers us or why that, that, that smell, that sight, that, that thing does this or, you know, any, anything like that. And so there's, um, I, I, I know at least for me, I, 
you know, even in the work I do, I do now, I'm constantly trying to like uh, dig out all the cognitive dissonance. It's like waging war in my head over the little, the little boy version of me who experienced like physical and sexual abuse or like the adult male of me who's my brother took his life a year ago and still trying to figure out why I still, you know, why I'm trying to figure out the, that his clothes in the closet, like I, I don't even know who that was and, and, and what happened there and trying to put all these little pieces, you know, of my life together with bookends of, of meaning and, uh, and, and the work that I do, like I'm hearing many of you do in one form or another. And I think it's just a, a you know, a complex and fascinating puzzle um, that, that I'm, I'm constantly trying to like make sense of. And then also at, at various points when applicable or, or when it makes sense to justify or explain to other people, because they really, I, I find that they also are, are struggling with their own things or they just don't know how to be present right there with another human being in it to receive it as a gift, not as a horror show. Um, but yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to digress and, and drift off too much. And, uh, so. No, it was beautiful. Matthew and Mallory is both very yeah, eloquent. What you said. I agree. And thank you for indulging my, um, off the cuff. <laughs> a uh, discussion inspired question, um, which I think really gets to the heart of, of why each of you really do what you do. Um, the idea of putting it out there uh, in your practices, in your ways to, to create that connection, to foster those connections, to um, provide a safe space and a venue and an outlet and, um, a way for others to know that they're not alone. And I do agree um, that this, as younger generations, um, future generations, as time goes by, at least I can hope um, that we do accept more, talk more, um, heal more, connect more. And uh, I think what I would let... Was that Julie in the background? I'm not sure. I thought I saw yeah. some. Yeah, I saw her name light up. So. Um, but uh, I, I do know we're we're a little bit past the 8 o'clock timeline, and we do have, um, I think, at least one guest maybe, Michelle, if Michelle is still here, if there's any questions. Um, and also I'd like to open it up for if anyone wants to talk about any current or upcoming projects that relate to uh, mental health and wellness that uh, may be of interest to our audience, um, either now or our recorded audience uh, in the future. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, Brian, I know, um, do you have any exhibitions coming up or like, what are you doing? Yeah, so um, I don't currently have anything. I kind of took a step back after my um, time with educating um, alongside Mallory. Um, and I... <laughs> Um, currently, like I, um, in my little bio, said I'm currently working with Kennedy Krieger. So I'm kind of just really um, taking the time to guide my path towards actually looking at, like, really di diving into art therapy and, like, maybe going back to school for it and, like, really breaking into it. Um, and at this point, I'm kind of just, like, I'm learning the phases. I work within behavior psychology at Kennedy Krieger, and I'm just kind of, like, soaking it in. And I'm just, like, taking in what's happening. I'm hearing stories like Matthew was like, like hearing stories is like one of the most amazing things about the job that I have right now. Um, I work in intake. So it's kind of just like this nonstop flow of just like seeing different perspectives and really, and it's something that I, I love that we talked about a little bit too. And my boss always um, tries to like work into our like team is that we can always sympathize with the family. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's a select few that we can really empathize with and really know what's yeah. going on. And like, from our experience, we can be like, no, I trust yeah. me, I understand. And then of course you can't, you can't really say that. And you can't really like, you know, I'm just trying to get your information to help you get seen, you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to have like your therapy session here. Um, but yeah, I think it's just really taking the time again to just sit, I'm working through my stuff. I'm, you know, rehashing all my thesis stuff. I'm diving back into it and really um, flushing it out for applications in the future and things like that. Um, 
but yeah, and I think most of my stuff has just really been like through digital. And like, if you find me on socials, you can see what my stuff is in progress, but that's pretty much where you can see my direction going. <laughs> well, you're living it. So that's good. And I'll be, <laughs> you know, to see where that takes you, um, in, in the near future. Um, Matthew, I know that your, your book, is that just published? Is that out? Oh. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, so my book is called Heart Leader. Um, and it is, um, you know, a trauma responsive approach to teaching, leading and building community. And it really starts around uh, recognizing one's own trauma, one's own origins and kind of takes, um, you know, the reader through part of my story and then connects the readers you know, work and there's a lot of places in the book to write and draw and kind of reflect. And then it uh, focuses on students, um, community partners, parents, school staff, and really it's kind of a training guide for trauma responsive um, education, social emotional supports and building family and school engagement. Um, yeah, so I've been, I guess, one form or another researching it and partnering with people for 26 years of my teaching, but it's worked on it about last about 11 years and been writing it really dedicatedly for about six years now. And it, um, it's just been released pre-order with my company, uh, on Amazon. And then the, there's a worldwide launch on January 2nd to actually like get the book itself, but you can pre-order now on Amazon, the Kindle version. So that's heart leader. So yeah, yeah that's, that's out. And then I, like, I, I think I mentioned earlier, I, I write and publish a lot. So there's a bunch on Edutopia that I write for and a couple other national publications. Most of my work is in, in and around trauma and social, emotional, strategic work. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got some other stuff going on, but yeah, that's, that's more than enough. <laughs> well, congratulations thank on your book. Sorry. Sorry, Nicole. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Congratulations. And thank you. No, that's amazing. So heart leader, everyone, um, if you're interested in, in seeing what Matthew has been up to, um, as Sammy, mm. what he got planned. Well, speaking of books, I, I want to go grab it from my shelf right now, but it's fine. All right. Let me go. All right. Sorry, I have a bunch of books on my shelf. Um, <laughs> so I, I know what you meant, Matthew, by working years and years and years, although I think you've worked much longer on your book. <laughs> but also a book, uh, 50 Lives, 50 Truths, Reimagined Through Art. Yay! Um, mine will be, ours will be on Amazon. Um, probably, uh, probably a release date of like in March or April. So I'm going to get it up there for pre-orders. But you know, it's just been four years of of interviewing 25 people, all stories, you know, touching on trauma and, and suicide and child loss, just all of those hard topics that it's hard to talk about. And all of their stories have just been reimagined through art. Um, so it's 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 wild and it's almost surreal to be able to hold it um, and actually be like, oh, my gosh, it's real. So. Um, just a lot of of heart and dedication and collaboration went into this. Um, so yeah, that should be also probably ready for pre-order sometime and and ready to go in March or April next year. But other than that, um, we're thinking of doing a documentary just on Empty Hourglass. Just get it out there more. Maybe try and get it into some schools. Just keep pushing out there and reaching people. So yeah, awesome. I think that sounds really interesting. Well, one, I can't wait to get a copy of the book. Um, <laughs> and two, oh gosh, the documentary sounds really, yeah. <laughs> a really good way of, of getting yeah. the word out there. We uh, recently had a screen of um, Big Infinite Power of Expression documentary um, about Jordan Lally and his bandmates and the Ed Lally Foundation for Suicide Prevention and Awareness. And that was really, it was really spectacular. So, um, just another, a shout out for Jordan and, uh, mm -hmm. folks. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, it's, it's really, really good. Um, Mallory, would you like to add anything, uh, before we sign off for the evening? 
Sure. I'll just add like a little sentiment that I kind of wrote on the side when I was hearing what um, Matthew was saying towards the end um, about just kind of, um, I don't know, just the kind of process of processing trauma and um, the different selves and things to that effect and, and the people who are trying to stomp out the light. And I just kind of thought about how like, almost if I were to try to pinpoint who's trying to stomp out the light and almost what they would ground that in, like why someone would have that. And I was thinking about like Darwin's survival of the fittest could be an argument for a kind of counter argument, if you will. But I think that in truth, um, the resilient ones are the ones who persist and the resilient ones are the ones that are in our company. So I think that's another one. That's a, another way of kind of empowering and emboldening, like kind of the conversation we're having today. I agree. Thank you. I, I do agree. Thank you. Um, and with that, I think we'll wrap up the official portion of uh, this evening. So I want to thank all of the panelists for coming and lending their time and talent, knowledge, and perspectives. Um, Empty Hourglass is still on view at the CCBC Catonsville Gallery until uh, Friday. Um, yes. We yes. December eighth. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness! I had the Not this Friday. Next <laughs> Friday. Oh my gosh! Where is December eighth? <laughs> December eighth. Forgive me. Forgive me, too much stuff. Um, so we still have some time if anyone would like to still see it. And uh, for anyone who can't make it, we do have a 3D Matterport tour um, that is up on the website. So you can at least experience it virtually. Um, but I do encourage attendance because it's awesome and immersive and wonderful. So um, on that note, we'll go ahead and sign off for tonight. If the panelists can just stay for a quick wrap up after. Thank you, everyone. and. I do want to say just one quick note. I just appreciate all of you just taking the time to come on here because I know you've all got busy lives and just to like share what your experiences are and your perspectives. And um, it's been very enlightening and it's it's been um, heartwarming. I kind of hate that word because it feels cheesy, but it has felt heartwarming just to have this conversation with all of you. And um, I'm very honored to know people of such strength and who've done wonderful things with with themselves and their lives and everything they've gone through. So thank you for being healers and, and helping people who have been in similar situations. So, and thank you, Nicole, for leading it. So yay you. <laughs> so yeah, I appreciate you guys. <laughs>